yes okay thanks and yeah see you yes. see you later after the next break bye so next up is let me write it in hackmd so notes. the the notes <laughs> okay we we will so, do this all week <laughs> so the next part is called humans of scientific computing and the idea here is that we've had like all these courses have always been talking about the technical properties of what we're doing like how um how you how we run stuff and the computers and so on but we rarely talk about us and we're the ones that you see and are helping you. And it can be a good example to let you know about how we got here and how we know how to support you and maybe even give you some inspiration for your careers. So yeah, um, you can be asking questions down here. Um, there's no slides or anything anything for this. I just have some questions prepared. And it will basically be me interviewing Temu here. So Temu is a research software engineer who started with us last year about nine months ago or so, something like that, after the summer. And yeah, well, let's start off. So Temu, can you tell me a little bit about your background? Yeah. Uh... I, I'm originally from Alto. I did my studies in Alto. So uh, I started in 2005 and the year is kind of relevant a bit later because, uh, and my studies were signal processing and machine learning and, and later on data science more generally. Um, so, so my studies were not were not software that that is i think okay. the main point here so i did yeah. programming but i i didn't do software and then so i like... i graduated i did my phd also in alto and i graduated in 2016. okay so... um yeah so then once you got your PhD, how did you start off your career? Yeah, so, I so after, PhD yes, after the career, PhD but... and after you do your PhD, you usually are kicked out from the university. And of course, <laughs> that is what happened to me as well. So I did two postdoc periods or or like six years as a postdoc researcher. Mm -hmm. And what I did was uh, I was working for a national library and, and then in a well, well, the point is that I was working uh, with within like digital humanities and and digital social sciences projects, research projects. So basically, you were the computer person. Yes, there, I was the, the computer guy program. or the data guy. Mm -hmm. And and then what happens is uh, happens very naturally or very naturally to me is that you you realize that you are actually uh, you are actually more your role is more about helping the other researchers mm -hmm. who don't have a really like a technical background mm -hmm. uh, so you are helping them with their data so so scraping data collecting data processing data and making it into a format that the other people can other people can uh, process and do their research. Mm -hmm. So it's more about like facilitating other people's jobs than yeah. and then then at some point I realized that I haven't actually done any research in many years because yeah. of, uh, all my working hours were like helping others. So did and like that's how like, did you like yeah. this? Yeah, project? exactly. And that's that's how we come to this uh to this present that that I I actually really like that role, but it's I was still a researcher, so there's this mm -hmm. conflict that you're supposed to be writing articles and making yeah. uh, making like, like 
studies, but then you're you don't really do that. Yeah. So but is it fair to say you weren't a researcher? Like I guess like were your names on the papers? Like I mean I guess all the project that happened just couldn't have happened without you. So yeah. if we believe in collaboration, how can you not be a researcher there? I mean yeah, actually I, I know the yeah. answer, which is that academia has the rewards are all mixed up. So yeah, but like that that's a good question. That like am am I a researcher when I'm actually making like yeah. facilitating the group and and nothing happens without your input, but then kind of like this is still you're you're not the yeah. one like making the questions or but anyway, so so the next step was that this this alter position, this research software engineer position came up and uh and so i came here and now i'm in the support role like doing Officially. doing very much what i was doing already but now i'm not a researcher anymore i'm the, the like well, uh, support pers role. personally i consider us researchers even though okay. hr wouldn't consider us i mean okay yeah we just have a and different role in the process and by the way one one important thing that i i thought that that simo and thomas and enrico and you and me we are all all these basically these research software engineers mm -hmm. in in alto so so we are the people uh, especially simo and i guess yeah, especially Simo is the one people like making the HPC clusters happen, and then then if you need, if if all the people need help, then we are the guys who can who are there to help out. Yeah. We've been mentioning this term research software engineer, and I haven't given a proper introduction to it yet. Mm -hmm. So, what does research software engineer mean? No, well, you know you. You want me to answer? <laughs> you know, that. you know that there's no good answer, and then, then like, <laughs> like, yeah. like, so it's unfair to throw that ball to me. But, okay, I'll uh, give my yeah. attempt to answer. Yes, yes, please do because okay. you have re you have been so, rehearsing. So it was a term invented about ten years ago to represent people who are in the research process, but they're goal is to work with software and data and make research possible instead of being solely focused on writing the papers and coming up with ideas. And this is something that we've started at Alto for some time now. And we have the service available where us research software engineers can basically come and ask you like we, we, you can ask us and we can come and help your work with our specialties. So you can focus on your articles and science and ideas and so on and not have the computer get in your way. And I think you'll hear more about this as time goes on in the course, but yeah, maybe someone can put a link to the RSE page in here since we're talking about it in the HackMD, in the notes. Um, let's see. Yeah. So in research, what like what have you learned from your research jobs that helps you now that you're working for us here? Like, has that time been wasted or was it important for what you do now? Uh, as, as, uh, uh, no, it, it, it wasn't wasted, and especially, I think there are two things here. The first thing is that it is very good for us in our support role to actually know research and know how research is done and know how researchers work. So I that is definitely one positive thing. Because uh, if somebody comes to do this role from purely an industry background, for example, then it might be um, kind of surprising that what are the workflows for academic researchers, for example. 
in right, in good yeah. in good and bad. <laughs> For example, that the timetables are very lively, and and there are long periods time of time when seemingly seemingly nothing is happening, but then you have a conference deadline, and then suddenly like like uh, the world is on fire. That everything is like needs to be done like immediately. But then the second second thing is that uh, when I started to started to uh, kind of like listen to other people and what are they requiring their requirements, what kind of data they need, how how they need the data to be processed. And also like communicating these things that what is actually, what can be done and in what timetable. Then I was, then I started to learn this software side mm -hmm. because in my own studies and in my own research, I, I didn't, I was doing programming, I was doing algorithms, I was doing data, but I didn't actually uh, know the software practices. And so then I was, I started to learn them. Yeah. So and and that about, is that is of course very useful. Yeah. Were you worried about making this transition, like when you first saw this as the possibility to come work for us? Did you were you anxious or anything? Mm, yeah, I, I think my my main point of anxiety was that uh, because I hadn't had any any formal education or I didn't have like a, a basically like self-taught mm -hmm. so so that are there a lot of things that I don't know that I don't know are they like unknown yeah, yeah. unknowns the, un that yeah. <laughs> that I get that I get like um uh, I get like steamrolled with stuff that I I didn't know even existed yeah. But but then um, it turns out that that kind of like all of us are in a sense like self-taught mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and also that nobody knows everything. Yeah. And even now when uh, when people come to us, the researchers and and they have a project or or they have a problem, most often is just that let's start thinking about it together and let's try to solve the problem and you don't have but it always works out somehow I yeah guess. it somehow works out and yeah. and like people right. yeah it's it's important to important to have an open mind and yeah and uh, try so, to okay they've got so the follow-up question. So what do you know now that you wish someone had told you or taught you when you started your career? And you get to choose at what point this is. Yeah, I I think um I think the like software development practices, like how to how to use version control, how to use, um, how to use environments, like efficiently virtual environments, and 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 how to, which. Those were the things that, I started, doing, very very late, in my, uh, research uh, okay. research yeah. career. And I hope that, like, I would have been uh, smart enough to start using <laughs> them right away, because those are like software development practices. Uh, but but they are not meant to be kind of a burden, because they actually make things uh, a lot easier for you in the long run. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, and these are these are things that like this this uh, research software engineers can help researchers, for example, now. So yeah. we can we can help people so that they don't repeat our mistakes. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a question for me in the notes. What motivates you to make a transition to data science? I guess this is for me specifically. Mm -hmm. So, so people know my background was in computational chemistry and chemical physics, that kind of stuff. And the transition to data science, I mean, it sort of happened gradually. Like I started doing more and more data related things. And actually there was one point where, okay, during my PhD, I moved a little bit that way. And then for my postdoc, I realized getting experience in a completely different field would probably be good for my career. So I went somewhere where the work was much more data science-y. And I think it's good. I mean, mm -hmm. this is the interdisciplinary kind of stuff that we care about. I mean, not that computational or not that computational physics is that far from data science compared to other things, but mm -hmm. still. Okay. So what would you say to someone who might be interested in careers outside 10 year track, like someone in academia, but mm. might be interested in things that are not just tenure track? Or do you have any thoughts there? Uh, yeah, it's it's really hard to it's really hard to say there's just uh, it's just difficult to be a PhD student or a or a researcher because it's it's really tough because like you're always applying for money and always always having this kind of like one year plan or two year plan and so so yeah I I don't think I'm in a in a good position to yeah. to give any advice to anyone <laughs> okay we can we can we can give like emotional support in our <laughs> research yeah <laughs> yeah so I guess there's two final questions and we're almost out of time so it is what do you hope to continue learning and what comes next in your career have uh, you thought anymore yeah at the at the moment i'm i'm really content with the with the this rsc job I, I really like helping people. Uh, so I think I'm, for now, I'm very content to just be here and, and like learn, learn new stuff that relates to this because there's always like every day something new to learn because yeah. the tools are just going forward in such a fast manner that yeah okay so that is, that is what is next yeah so um i guess now we can do a quick hackmd q and a but we can also continue this during the break asynchronously um yeah. so there's a question do I need to apply for funding now and then? So I am working on getting funding for the research software engineer service itself, but it's not like my personal funding. So it's like, you know, individually we have our jobs, we're secure and we have a future and we're working together to uh, ensure the team's future, which is a much different thing than everyone's contract on the lasting two years and everyone just expects to have to be gone sometime. So it's a much different kind of applying for funding. And also, I mean, our funding is basically secure from the School of Science. So we aren't, we don't have to keep renew, like doing things on a short term and we actually can take a long-term view, which is really important. There's a good question there. What are the key skills and technologies required for research software engineer? So actually someone put up this link here to coderefinery.org. And this is a thing which we are part of, um, Alto's part of, and it runs workshops twice a year. And I would basically say it's like the RSC basics course kind of thing. It talks about version control, software testing, documentation, things like that. and if you attend that workshop, you'll be set on a good path. And we can try to comment a little bit more during the break. 
um any final comments or anything yeah i, I wanted to say a, a one thing about what what demo said that was really good good so so about like the yeah, learning of the new tools and what the future holds uh in that like throughout the whole whole like whenever you're starting what whatever point you are in your like uh computational journey or like learning using these tools or whatever it's going to be always this kind of a thing that there's always going to be new tools there's always going to be new things and you feel at some point you will feel lost in all of these things and everybody else has more shiny tools than you have and like your your uh, your stuff is crap and everybody else is crappy stuff so you you get this feeling that like uh something uh, like maybe you you don't know about some stuff and that happens to everyone that happens to us as well so so don't be this targets so so i would say that like there are always going to be new tools because stuff is moving forwards like the, uh, the 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 tools are moving forwards and we constantly have to really re uh invigorate ourselves and find find new things to, to use and and, and reevaluate what is what is actually now like what is now required yes and what and now so 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 it's it's always good to remember that like throughout this course there will be a lot of new concepts throughout your research pros, uh, progress there will be a lot of new things to learn don't be discouraged by it because everybody is like going to encounter uh, like encounter the same things so so that will happen like it will happen to you it will happen to everybody nobody will know about new things or understand new things when they first encounter them and about the like stuff that you can already learn it's it's always good idea to go where somebody has like already plowed the the road for you so the code refinery and places like that are very good places to learn what somebody else has learned to work basically to learn from people who who already have like good practices and and we do it as well like when we encounter somebody who has a nice thing we try to incorporate it into our workflows because uh like yeah why why use <laughs> bad tools when they're good available but not everybody like you cannot know them before you encounter them so it's always good idea to to keep like uh keep on the lookout and find this stuff but i think yeah maybe it's time for a break i just wanted to add this mm, good addition yeah okay so i think we should get to the break soon so as you may see here there's a another poll so you can answer is the course good? Okay, needs improvement. Too fast, too slow. Good topics. Vote for all that apply with the O's like we did at the start. So with that said, I guess our break extends until five past the hour. So see you later and do keep asking the questions. Okay, bye.